Welcome to Cover to Cover Book Beat. <laughs> Welcome the cat as well. I'm your host, Roger Nichols. Our guest today has had an interesting journey through life. Inel Holmes is a prolific novelist who once released seven books in a single year. Prior to that, she was an accomplished archaeologist and teacher for 25 years, and early in her career, she served as a nun for two decades. In between, she was an artist and antiques dealer. She has a doctorate in classical and Near Eastern archaeology studies from Bryn Mawr College, has excavated in Greece and Israel, and taught ancient history and humanities at Stockton University in New Jersey and University of South Florida for many years. She is the creator of two series of historical fiction, the Empire at Twilight series, set in the Hittite Empire in the 13th century BCE, and the Lord Hanni series, set in ancient Egypt. The latest edition, and I've counted right, I believe it's the seventh in the series, is titled Flowers of Evil, set in the reign of King Tutankhamun, circa 1335 BCE. Very pleased to welcome back N.C. Holmes. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah. Did you uh, originally decide to use your initials instead of your first name because you thought you might face editorial discrimination as a woman? Well, it wasn't so much for the editorial discrimination, but I've, I have heard that men are reluctant to read books written by women. So I, I thought I'd just go sort of gender neutral there. OK, so as a marketing rather than an acceptance decision on the part of the editorial. OK. Yeah. You know, I, there are not a lot of stories set in either of those ancient empires, let alone a connected series like yours. And as I recall, this all came about from an epiphany that arose from the assignment you gave to your class at one time. Yes, I was teaching a class in ancient Near Eastern empires, and we, we were studying as a kind of an experiment in uh, making use of ancient documents, uh, a certain divorce that took place in the kingdom of Ugarit which was part of the Hittite empire. And we had, you know, two or three references to this event in uh, documentary sources. And so I, I gave them all to the students and said, this is what we know, try to explain what happened. And of course, some of the results were pretty fanciful. I, it became clear to me very quickly that you know anything you could pull up out of these little snippets of fact were less historiography and, and more sort of historical fiction. So I thought to myself, darn, when I uh, when I retire, this is what I want to do. Well, if your retirement suits you, I will say that as a, as a reader and a fan. And uh, fans of Lord Honey should know that this book, Flowers of Evil, the investigative torch passed to his daughter. Now, you're going to have to help me with the pronunciations here because my ancient Egyptian is not perfect. Oh, but his da da is mine. daughter Neferet. <clears throat> and, and Neferet, yes. Neferet, uh -huh. And her partner ben or Eb. Exactly, yes. Okay, with occasional help and sometimes unhelp, provided by Mut Toy, a 13 year old or orphan adopted by an apprentice to the two of them. Um, the personalities really come through in this book. And but to a particularly memorable for her teenage behavior, typical even more than 3,000 years ago. She was fun to write, I'm sure. She was, yes. I, she sort of channeled my teenage self, I guess. Yeah. Now, the basic plot, we don't want to give too much away, but it is a murder mystery triggered by the violent death of Pen Bui, a florist for Amun-Ra, the chief deity of the Egyptian empire. Who would want to kill him and why? And the reason that these two are involved is because the dying florist is brought to their new medical dispensary. They can't save him, but it piques their curiosity. And I love the setup here because it is, it is very unusual. You get kind of hints of modern day ER and, and uh, other things together. You have a, this is a really talent you have for taking tropes and extending them in both directions. Well, thank you. I, I, we know a lot about ancient Egypt, but we know very little. Of it. On the other hand, uh, for example, about medicine, we have written sources that tell us kind of, you know, what they used for medicines and what they did for certain things. But it, they're case books, you know, it's not like a day in the life of a physician. So we sort of don't know so much about what it was like to be a doctor let alone a woman doctor, which did exist, but they were rare. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, she not only has to fight disease, she has to fight the prejudice too. And that comes yeah. up at, at a couple of, one of the things that I do when I, I read books is I take notes and they're lovely ones that I've come up from, from yours. 
but you have some interesting uh, things. For instance, I, I'll quote two items that re reflect what you just said. Uh, you say, it's the same story as always. Men can do it, but women can't. If I had a copper debon for every time somebody said to me about practicing medicine, I'd be rich, which is one, one of those quotes that just, some things never change. And yeah, the other one was, not. sometimes what's heroic for a man is dangerous for a woman. Again, ad an attitude that uh, pervades, I'm afraid. Yes, I, and you you always run the danger of, of putting anachronistic thoughts in a, a character's head. I mean, certainly it was a patriarchal society, and I think women by and large accepted that and were complicit with it. But Nefret is definitely countercultural. You can call her a little modern, but, you know, there, there have always been uppity women. And sometimes they're in positions of power. I mean, she lived also during the reign of, of a female king. But um, for a woman of the, I won't say middle class, she was definitely of the aristocracy. But I think it, I think it's not out of character for the times for her to want to push the envelope a little bit. Uh, certainly, women were were pretty visible in Egyptian society. Mm -hmm. I, you you talk about anachronisms, and I find really interesting that you don't use them at all uh in fact your descriptions of the characters even their similes are based in the techniques of the time for instance uh you don't use like for instance lock stock and barrel which refers to the key parts of a flintlock gun but right. one of the quotes <clears throat> that triggered that for me was the idea of him gloating over her capitulation sent a curl of smoke fuming up in her heart that's something, a, a simile that they would understand back then and, and still appropriate to the era. Yeah. Yes, and that, that was a little tricky. I mean, you find yourself just wanting to, to embrace some of these expressions that are so common to mm -hmm. us that we don't even think about the origins of them. Uh, that was a great example you gave. And I, I, at one point, I wanted to say someone had steel gray hair, but, but no, 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 there was no steel. So got to work around that. Well, I'm glad you mentioned color because the next quote I have is about a sky the color of beaten electrum. Now, electrum, mm -hmm. as a, I'm, I'm a pneumatic uh, expert, and one of the things that, that was early coinage was often made from this naturally occurring alloy of gold and silver with some trace amounts of copper, but the color is pale to bright yellow on that. So it was perfectly done for that. So I give you extra bonus points for that. Well, thank you. Only a numismatist would uh... Appreciate that. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of insights in here. And I like this one too. My, uh, it was, she says, my partner and I are sunets, not investigators. It's true, but we're trained to look for causes and effects and what are symptoms, but clues to a mystery. It was an interesting thought. Yes, well, I'm not a doctor. so I, I, But it seems to me that that's true. And it's certainly true of what they would have understood about medicine. <clears throat> and I have to ask about this because at one point she asked Mutoy, do you know how to play hot hand, cold hand? I assume that's an ancient game. I have no idea. That that is an ancient game that I made up. I, ah, okay. I, there there are I can picture the the image of the children playing this. I mean that part was real, but we don't know the names of it. So uh -huh. like so many other everyday things, we don't know about ancient Egypt. So I. Uh, I constructed that. Oh, okay. Well, I, I noticed that, so it, it's, it stood out. Um, and there's some, one other thing that, that I think was very convincing and putting me in the place, she talks about her picking up a potsherd and some charcoal to take notes. So they didn't have, they had papyrus, a certain amount, but they didn't have paper. Certainly no. not handy and in quantity available at all times. So that was a real key to, to me to put me in the era. Well, good. I'm glad it worked. I mean, it was something we see a lot of uh, in the workmen's villages, for example. People would draw pictures or or write on bits of stone or, or pot shirts, it's mm -hmm. whatever uh, was at hand. Rather than throw it away, it's like recycling. Yeah. Um, I just, again, I, I, I love these similes, but at one point she says, may the gods bless you, Sit Amun. You're a ripe fig among women. <laughs> and and nobody likes an unripe fig so uh, no no but we really love the ripe it's, it's indeed 
Um, I somehow get the feeling that these two characters uh, and their partners in both senses of the word uh, had to have to kind of keep that on the down low, as we would say today. Right. It, it was um, the Egyptians were very liberated sexually. They they believed the body was good and pleasure was was great. But but on the other hand, they also were very big on procreation because that was sharing in the, the creative work of the gods. It was a sacred thing. And so a relationship that, you know, didn't have the potential to lead to children was looked looked at askance. Uh, we do have records of, of male homosexual relationships, but I don't believe women are ever mentioned. And yet, you know, it was true, probably and in exactly the same proportions as it is today, I'm sure. So yeah, they would have had to kind of keep it subtle on the surface. And that was the whole thinking behind a Nefret's marriage to Lord Thomas was to kind of cloak her relationship with res respectability. Right, a, a beard, I guess, is the common term. The beard, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I'm reminded of, of why there were not laws against lesbianism in uh, England because nobody wanted to even try to explain it to Queen Victoria. And, <laughs> Interesting. Yes, Interesting. women were invisible, essentially, like, you know, right. all, and all of the relationships. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the fact that that you've got uh, Lord Hani appearing, she consults him a, a bit, kind of makes a connection to some of the previous novels. And I think that's as you go through the timeline and you keep writing these, it's interesting to see how you tie them together like that. Yeah, it, it, it almost turned out after the fact that there were uh, continuing arcs. And of course, his family is very important in the Hani mystery. So one of the arcs is to see the children grow up. And, and Nefret was seven, I believe, in the first volume. Mm -hmm. And now starting her own series uh, as sort of an off spin of the Hani series, she starts out at I believe 24. So a lot of time has passed <laughs> and we've, we've gotten to know her and, and seen how she develops. And it was fun, but challenging to age her appropriately. It was, you know, she has to be the same person she was at seven and yet a grown up. She also has um, not only a lot of drive, but a lot of excitement in her. I think that communicates well to the, to the reader and helps us, you know, interact with the character. Good, yeah. She's she's kind of a, a fun character to write. She's uh, not only countercultural; she's her own person, and she pretty much makes her own rules and uh, is not easily thwarted or or corrected or put down. She she's a feisty sort of person, and that was you know that was fun to to take such a person and put her in a period where this might not have been much appreciated on some fronts. And, and, and yet make her sympathetic, yeah. yeah. And she's not treated well by some of the male characters in the book. No, exactly. They they do suffer. Uh, their business suffers at first because people are afraid to to trust their sick to young women. And that's it's interesting. I mean, it's the young that's kind of the operative part here because they took over the uh, the dispensary of an old village healer, kind of a neighborhood healer who was kind of a medicine woman or an herbalist, I guess we'd say, not educated like they were. But people trusted her because she was old and it's, you know, she had, she was a midwife. She had uh, had the experience of taking care of the sick in a way that women kind of always do. And yet those same neighborhood people were skeptical about the two youngsters who come loaded with book knowledge and stuff. So. Yeah, it was it was kind of a fun thing to imagine. Yeah. Again, the uh, the portrayal of every, all of the characters really a lot of fun all all the way through. Um, the, one of the descriptions uh, of, about her says the only way to disengage her from the case is to solve it, which I thought was a great great, great little bit of character building right there. Um, there, there's another fun, again, I keep coming back to, there's so many really great little bits in here. Um, she called uh, somebody a walking wart. And I'm going to put that into my vocabulary for use as an insult. <laughs> if, 
Exactly. Trying to keep it family friendly. That's, it, it, <laughs> that's what they did. Exactly. And I will have to say, this is family fr family friendly throughout. There's there's no, yeah. there are some, a couple of instances of violence, but it's not gratuitous. And right. uh, there's nothing to, to make uh, grandma blush in here. With, with no, I, I've tried to keep it in, in the cozy genre there. So yeah. nothing, uh, no, no explicit sex, no, uh, no bloody violence. Yeah. But there's enough tension as they try to solve the mystery. Again, what what uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock called the MacGuffin, the thing that has to be figured out for the for the mystery to be solved. Um, I have to we'll ask a little bit about process. When you start the next novel, you probably already have a the next novel in the process because I know it takes a while to process everything and get it all out. What do you do? Do you sit down with a blank piece of uh, paper and I, I guess you or sit down at your computer these days and just start typing, or do you plot it out ahead of time? I, I do not plot ahead of time, which mm -hmm. is perhaps dangerous if you're writing mysteries. Um, and in fact, I'd say I don't know who done it until the reader does. Uh, that's just the way I write, and I've tried doing it differently, and it just doesn't work. So uh, I sit down at my computer, and I I have a kind of a a vague overall idea. I, for example, in this series uh, about Neferet, I want to feature a different profession each time. So in the first one, it's the florists. In the second one, it's weavers. In the third one, it's chariot makers. And, you know, so some kind of crime that will fit in that profession. Um, and beyond that, I, I, I'm not being evasive, honestly. I, I It's very difficult to say how I start to work. It's, uh, I have the characters and they're the ones who lead me into the story. Uh, which does sound evasive, I admit, but it's it's really true. So I, I present them with a situation. Someone's obviously been killed because they're murder mysteries. And and then I let them react to the situation. So we know how Neferit's going to react. She's going to want to ferret out, you know, the facts behind this. And Ben or Ib will be skeptical and Mutui will want to go out and smash foreheads. And, and so, you know, I let them lead me into the plot. When I figure out who did it, then I may have to go back and salt it with clues, mm -hmm. you know, sort of tweak it a little to fit the ending when I finally reach the ending. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a sort of unconventional way of, of proceeding, which is not logical and step by step. It, it sometimes involves steps backward and then and steps forward. <laughs> so I understand. It's interesting because I've interviewed a number of authors, and it's about 50-50 between what they call the pantsers, seat of the pants writers, and the plotters. Right, right. And yeah. each one of them just says, I couldn't do it the other way. So it's it, I, it has to do with personality type, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's it's always always intriguing. Um when when you close when they readers close this book, what do you hope they take home with them? Well, I, I guess it's the same thing that I hoped my students would take away from my classes when I taught. And that is to understand better how uh, how human the people of the past were, that they were just like us, and that they, uh, that they had a different worldview, perhaps, undoubtedly. Uh, they wore different clothes and spoke different languages, but they had the same range of emotions and reacted the same way we do to different stimuli and and so i think if you understand that it makes all of history much more comprehensible and interesting uh, why do people invade or why do they sign a peace treaty because they're human beings and this is at stake or that and it's often their vanity as well as some objective thing so I feel that's what uh, historical fiction brings to the table, too. I think it's worthwhile, you know, as worthwhile as reading a history book, frankly, if it's well-researched. It, uh, it humanizes what can be, people tell me, a dry subject. If that's, yeah, I remember some college classes that weren't all that entertaining about that. Yeah. Here, memorize this list of kings. Uh, okay. Exactly. Well, I mean, yeah. really, that's that's not what history is. but And yet that's the way we have to learn it sometimes. Yeah, again, because not, we have only certain bits and pieces that have come down to us. But 
reduced considerably from what happened at the time because you can't record everything. Do you ever have any of your old students contact you after seeing it and said, I was in that class where you asked that question? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have, but I, I've certainly been in contact with my students and I know they've bought the books, you know, and enjoyed them and stuff. Uh, I'd, I'd like to sort of make contact on that particular point too. I wonder if, uh, I wonder if any of those particular students have noticed. It'd be interesting to find out. It, it would. I'm indeed. not a huge social media person, so I, I, I probably don't, uh, <laughs> don't hang out where they do. Yeah. Again, that's, that's a very generational thing uh, yeah. in, in, involved in that. Where do you see the series going? Do you have an end point in mind? Well, not not necessarily. The the Hani mysteries actually ha have ended because that that had a historical trajectory. It began with the beginning of the reign of Akhenaten, and mm. followed through that <clears throat> that uh, rebellion, and then it ended as his son comes to the throne and the old ways are brought back. The Nefret stories, she's young. She could go on for a long time. Uh, I, on the other hand, am not and, and won't. But, you know, I will keep going as long as I want to. Uh, but with her, there's not so much of a tie-in with historical events. It's it's more free-floating, uh, mm -hmm. sort of personal mysteries, not political intrigue like the Honey Books. Although I'm working on the third book right now, and there is a bit of historical intrigue involved in that so if i run out of such things then i guess the series is over but uh, no danger of that i i don't think there's a, a problem in that direction in fact i should mention that at the beginning of the book you put a helpful character chart and you asterisk those people who were real historical personages which honey is one of them and and never is not so uh it, it gives you in some sense a little more freedom to write because you're taking exactly a yeah. Exactly. She, she's fictional and so are her adventures. And so, you know, I can spin them along as long as I want. And we hope that's a, a very, very long time. Is Thank there you. anything we haven't touched on that you want to make sure that our listeners know about this latest book or any of the others? Well, um, that is the first of the uh, the Nefritz series, the uh, Hani's Daughter series. And as I say, I, I uh, have number two coming out in probably February of next year. And uh, the third one, I'm, I'm probably later in 2024. I haven't written that completely yet. But there is the other series is also proceeding. And there uh, a book came out in September, which might be of interest to your, uh, your listeners, called The Moon That Fell from heaven it's uh set in ugarit again it's part of the hittite series and that's kind of a fun one too it's a little lighter also than some of the other books in that series some of the earlier ones and we've talked about some of those in the past has a kind of a vast grand historical sweep of empires and uh back and forth battles and, and whatnot so it's kind of interesting to see you getting down to what you would call cozier stories or more more human-centered stories. Yeah, I mean, that's, I find the the sweep of history itself is, is so grandiose that, mm -hmm. that sometimes it's harder to relate to. I mean, to, to write in the voice of a king or something like that, you have to zero in on some human aspect of their life. I, I think it's too much almost, at least for me, to write something that is truly nothing more than the great events and movements of history. Uh, in the Hittite series, I kind of wanted to cover the last few generations before the fall of the empire. So I hope readers who follow it through will see a, a little bit of what's falling apart in each book. But on the other hand, I've, I've tried to bring in protagonists uh, that were not only royal, but, but other people, um, in this latest book, it, the main protagonist is the daughter of the emperor Tudhalia, who marries the, into the royal house of, of Ugarit. But then there's also a young aristocratic girl who is orphaned. There's a, a scribe who is a poet, a real person, actually. And it was fun because that allowed me to talk a little bit about and 
present to the reader some real ancient poetry. So it's, um, you know, I, I like, if if I have to talk about kings, then I like also to hit a more humble human <laughs> layer of society. Well, you're sneaking a little literature amongst it, which is which is an right. easy way. It's like it's like uh, putting your vegetables in something else in a sauce. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it has been a wonderful time talking with you yet again, and I hope we will see you in February ish to take the minute. That's right. Book. Yeah. Look forward to it. All right. Our guest today, NL Holmes, and her latest book is called Flowers of Evil. Very highly recommended. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you.